right, we are still dealing with Abraham, and um, we are in chapter 16. <clears throat> and I want to hit a few more things in um, verse 2, so we'll read that. Uh, Genesis 16, verse 2. And, and Sarah said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarah. So we had discussed last class that there were a lot of different reasons and a lot of different angles that she was coming from. And um, uh, th that thing, some of the things that might have been at work in her um, and some of them were even in contrast to one another. Um, so beginning here in our situation, it is difficult for us to see the big picture and to see how each portion fits together as a whole. And that is true because we tend to, <clears throat> we tend to see what we're going through. I probably got that written right here. We tend to see what we're going through at the moment. We don't see how this fits to that. And in fact, if it doesn't, if there's not a, a, a kind of a direct correlation that would make us think that, then we think either that's another thing or I'm past that and I'm here. <clears throat> and one of the things that you see in the Bible regularly is, I mean, my Lord, the whole thing ties together. I mean, I think that's one of the amazing things about the Bible is you have so many different writers, so many different kinds of writers over so many different time periods from the beginning till now, and yet the theme as led by the Holy Spirit is the same. And that's to me amazing, but, there's, but that could be just a, a fact, a fun fact <laughs> that, <laughs> hey, the Bible does this and that. But what if that fun fact became a reality in our life where we began to try to see how, see it says all things work together, but we're, we're looking at the present thing. We're not seeing how, because it didn't say all things by themselves do, you know, are good. It says they all are working together. So there's another scripture that just flat out says, wherever you are right now, you got there by many things working together. So um, we live more in the moment of the present circumstances, which I just said. To our way of thinking, many times what the Lord has done in the past has no bearing on our present. And, it, you know, in the lives of the people in the Bible, it had everything to do, everything to do with it. Uh, we seem to always need some new intervention on his part if we were to make it through our crisis. And that's, that's pretty normal for good old Christians. You know, we need divine intervention. Lord, you know, intervene. Now, you got to understand that, that God feels like he pretty much did the work on the cross. And it satisfies him. And, but we're trying to get him to do something here when he has something way back there that he did. Uh, and this is... Here's an example of that. You see this all throughout the Bible. You see this sort of phrase. I'm just thinking of it right now. But it's, um, uh, and so the Lord did this to so-and-so because of his promise to the fathers. Well, you see that all the way through the prophets, all the way through. Um, and, you know, we just read it and go, okay, well, yeah. But do you, can, can you kind of see how important it, it is that we're literally digging into Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because he's called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, um, and this he did because of them, not because of us, see. And yet we're so worried about us. Well, you know, I'm not worthy. I'm not, I'm not ready. I'm not smart enough, I'm not deep enough, I'm not uh, pretty enough or handsome enough, I'm not, um, well, it doesn't matter if you are or aren't, 
God, God doesn't judge by the outward appearance. I mean, he judges by the heart. Man judges by the outward appearance. <clears throat> but remember, God had plagued Pharaoh previous to this so that Abram wouldn't be killed and that Sarah would not belong to his harem. God did that. Knowing the end of the story, we realize God did it to protect the relationship between Abram and Sarah for Isaac's sake, the seed. But at the time, the question was probably asked, why would God care about Sarah if she was useless to the eternal plan? Because, it, come on, remember? It sort of appeared that Abram looked at it that way. It wasn't true, um, but, you know, uh, we can look at somebody that way. And, you know, I'll just say this. If we look down on somebody and say, well, they're not really uh, useful to the plan or something like that, then you exalted yourself and God's going to raise them up and bring you down. See? And you shouldn't do that with anybody, right? You shouldn't do it with them, including yourself. Oh, it got real quiet there. <laughs> <laughs> we should just keep our eyes on the Lord and we're going for him anyway you know <clears throat> um, knowing that let's see but at that time the question was probably asked why would God care about Sarah if she was useless to the eternal plan they probably thought that it was just punishment because Abram should have stayed in the promised land. In other words, all this bad stuff happening in e Egypt is because I failed, or she and I failed, but it would, it would be him, it would be Abram, uh, he's the head, because I failed and God is upset with me because he brought me out of the Ur of Chaldees to, uh, you know, to the border there and then brought, brought us in and then pretty quickly because a famine came up I ran for my life. Um, no, no. God's doing everything in relationship to his seed. I mean, he is. He, he put, you know, each one of us have his son in us. Do we forget that? Do we, do we not relate by the son? Do we, do we go, oh, Lord, here I am again, and I just want you to, you know, and he's going, hey, Check what's in your envelope, you know, in your heart. I put him in there, you know. Let him out. Let my firstborn go. You remember some of that stuff that we talked about? Let my firstborn son go. Um, and that was the father talking in, in Exodus. He's, he's recognizing that, um, that his people have him, as it were, inside and are not letting him be released. They're too busy being what they think is important to God. But what is important to him is his son, is the seed. And this whole thing with Abraham, and it, it, it is with, with um, Isaac and Jacob, you know, same thing. All right, so... Um, so I, that's why I said they probably thought that it was punishment because Abram should have stayed in the promised land. Okay. Well, let's, let's ask that question then. Should he have stayed in the promised land? Yes or no? I don't know. Maybe that was a part of his plan too in relationship to his seed to get certain things going. You know, we don't know everything. We don't have to know everything. We just have to know him. He knows everything. You know, ask my dad. You know what I mean? <laughs> Isn't that okay to work off of that premise? So, <clears throat> in our situations, there are times that we fail or whatever. And we may assume that the situation that I'm in right now is because I failed God. But I, I am asking right now that the Holy Spirit be able to move upon you to be able to, to um, remind you that the Father has a Son. And he's working. He's not just God. He's a, there's a Father and he has a Son. And he's working off that Son. And 
that's what he wants out of you. And if that's what it takes, or if that's the step before what it takes, or if that's the step, 10 steps before it is where he wants you, then, you know, I mean, we think, we think, well, men are so wise. Somebody invented chess. Okay, God has been, you know, move, make it, making moves in our lives constantly. He makes this move, and then this move goes to that move, and this move, and all of that. He's in control. And, but we're trying to control our lives. Um, I have a great example of that, but I won't use it. But I, but I am involved in it right now. <clears throat> um, so after all, God... So, so I, let me read that sentence again. They probably thought that it was uh, just punishment because Abram should have stayed in the promised land. After all, God had added that new stipulation not to go into Egypt with, uh, within Isaac's com covenant. And I'm referring to Genesis 26, verse 1 through 5, and that is that when Isaac, when God spoke to Isaac, this is interesting, when God spoke to Isaac, his son, after Abram was gone, or not, I don't remember if he was or wasn't at that point, but the, the covenant from God came to Isaac, and he said, stay in the land. So Abram didn't get that, but Isaac did. All right. So let's read. Um, well, actually, I have the scripture of that. We should read this, uh, Genesis 26, verse 1 through 5, which I was just talking about. And, and uh, this is another famine that it's going to start talking about. And it is not dealing with Abraham. It is dealing with his son. Okay, so they're both facing, they both are facing the same situation. They're in the land and a famine comes, and Abram's, Abram responds one way, and so God deals with Isaac another way because he's on the verge of a similar thing. So verse 1 of Genesis 26. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Ahimelech, uh, Abimelech, king of the Philistines unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, go not down into Egypt. So I guess that was a mistake, but it didn't matter. Did you know that you can make a mistake and God's still dealing with his seed? <laughs> he doesn't give up on Christ in you. He's not, you know, you made a mistake. I'm taking him out. You know, he, he doesn't do that, you know. Lord, you'd have to do heart surgery because he's in my heart. Okay, I, you, can, you can keep him. <laughs> um, go not down into Egypt and dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Um, sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee and will bless thee for unto thee and unto thy seed. See, there it is. Well, he's not talking about Isaac anymore. You see what I mean? We say, well, he's talking about somebody else. Well, he is, but in an, another sense, eternally, he's just talking about his seed. You know, Galatians 3, 16, he said, not unto seeds which are many, but unto thy seed which seed is Christ. And so he's saying, I don't care what generation you are. I don't care where you are at in the scope. If I put my son in you, then I am dealing with you in relation to my son. Okay, so, now I said he's dealing with us. I didn't say he's just dealing with his son. His son's fine. <laughs> he's dealing with us as, as to how we can relate and how we can bring forth that son, okay? So, um, Verse 3 again, sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee, uh, and unto thee, and unto thy seed. And I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And so, so again, 
it's as if God, and this, this works all the way up to Jews today, but this is as if God spoke something to, you, you know, you do know that Abraham is, Abraham is called the first Jew, right? Did you know that? He's the first Jew. He spoke to him, and he's still speaking to us through what he spoke to him. That's what the Jews, that's how the Jews see it, okay? They're connected. Do you understand what I'm trying, I'm trying to get across this thing that, you know, as Americans or whatever, we're, wherever I'm at at the moment, that's what's important, and, you know, pretty much I'm, you know. But it is connected. But what's the connection? The connection is his son. The connection is the father's heart toward his son. And that heart doesn't change. If, I mean, imagine, I mean, just please imagine if we actually got that, then we would always know that the father is pleased, uh, you know, as he looks at us. So the son's in us. And when the father comes up and gives us a big hug, he would hug his son. You know, you could feel the love and everything else. But he's in you, so you're getting the big hug. And you could say, I'm glad he's in me. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm glad he's in me because the father loves his son. He put him in me for a reason. And I'm supposed to begin to um, recognize that relationship, that eternal relationship. Forget Abraham. Bow before the foundation of the world. The Father and the Son. You know, read some of the Psalms that talk about that. They're powerful. So, um, so someone would say, well, what do these verses have to do with us? Well, it has everything to do with us. It has everything, and it has everything to do with every Christian. Now, every Christian has not come to that, and every Christian is not learning that, and every Christian, I mean, you can go out here and you can go to church and you can say, well, you know, and we can, someone can stand up and say, you know, uh, uh, worship leader or something, God loves us, and we'll go, oh, and we just feel so, you know, but trust me, if it's, if it's you or his son, he's going to choose his son. But he put his son in you. So you still get it all. But you get it all based on another. Okay, your salvation, what do you get that based on? Christ crucified, you know. Healing, da 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 da. Go, go through all the things that people say, Christian things. They're not Christian things. They're all his things. Yeah. And they all come to us. And we, we, don't, we don't go, thank you for the things. We say, thank you for the son who is within. No, we, we can say thank you for the things as long as, but I mean, if we're always focused on things, then something's wrong. Something's wrong. What do you mean something's wrong? Something's wrong with our heart then. We haven't recognized, we haven't come to that place. We haven't broken out of this shell of, of a, a little, baby chicken in a shell that has to peck its way out and broke through the shell of Christianity unto the relationship between the father and the son and being able to live outside of the shell, you know. Didn't you say y'all saw something like that just a few days ago? Wow. I must be a genius talking about that. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <clears throat> All right. Um, verse four, um, and I will make thee make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and will give unto thy seed all, the, and will give unto thy seed. And in thy seed shall all, you get it? I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed all. So you go, okay, I get it. I get it. 
I'm ready to, I want to get on the train. You know, the one that takes me to the station between the Father and the Son instead of the station where I'm at right now. I want to know life I, because, see, the Father and the Son, they're living. You know, um, covenants are not living, but the heart between those who make covenants are, was living. You see that? So there is all of this reality that is, that is based on life and then you have all of these other teachings and things that are based on really the law. Do this and I'll be pleased. Don't do this and I'll be upset. That's the law. You say, no, that's, that's Christianity. That's what I said. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm glad I'm 70, so I won't, you know, won't be around long enough to be killed for all of these things that I've said on tape. Somebody on Skype is going, I don't know. I heard there's a <laughs> crowd gathering. <laughs> All right. Verse 5, bless because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my law. Now, there's a lot to that because we think that's the law, and we're not ready to get into that. But it does involve Abraham, and it will involve chapter 22. All right, let's go to verse 3 in, back in uh, Genesis 16, if you please. Genesis 16, 3. <clears throat> and Sarah, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. All right, so... Um, We've discussed a lot already about this relationship, and um, we're going to discuss something in here, I think, that should, should shock us. Um, but um, So one of the things that, if you'll notice in verse 3, Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, okay? Uh, and let me just read this again. Verse 1 pointed out that Hagar was an Egyptian. Verse 1 did. Now we're in verse 3. Here again in verse 3, we're reminded of that fact. This is a very important for several reasons. Okay, this is real important to our story. It is real important to our story that she was an Egyptian. And it has several angles of why it's important. Okay? Okay. Egypt eventually came to rule the world, but right now uh, an Egyptian was Abram's slave, okay? So you know how big Egypt became, right? Pharaoh and all of that. And um, at that time they ruled the world, basically. And, uh, but right now Egyptians are alive, and one of them is Abraham and Sarah's slave, an Egyptian, that will be, their nation will be really big eventually. Um, <clears throat> Egypt eventually came to rule the world, but right now an Egyptian was Abraham's slave. When Egypt arises, will Hagar's seed emerge? And, and I wrote that because several reasons because I felt like the Lord told me to. But I wrote that because I am trying to get us to think and ask questions as we read the Bible. You know? I mean, we can just make zombies and go, okay, everything I say, you know, which is not what we want, and it won't get what God wants, okay? So we have to learn to go, okay, wait, why is... Um, <clears throat> Why is Hagar an Egyptian? And even to this point in the story, we've already had some pretty loud, she's, you know, Egypt, Egypt. And we, sh we should take those and put them together and say, Lord, why? Why? Why is this this way? You know, I mean, Jesus said the Holy Spirit will come and he'll guide you into all truth. He's like our teacher, right? 
He's going to show us Jesus. He's going to reveal Christ and all this stuff. If you really were a student and you had a real question, you would probably ask your teacher, right? You go to your teacher and say, I don't really understand that it does, you know. But do we treat the Holy Spirit that way? Do we, when we read it, go, hmm, do we ever just do that? Hmm. <laughs> or do we just go, la, la, la. Now, yes, remember this from yesterday. Give attention to reading. You don't have to see something by revelation every, t every time. But you can still ask questions. Do you understand what I'm saying? You may not get the answer right then, but you can say, Holy Spirit, you're my teacher. I mean, I've done this so many times I can't tell you. You're my teacher. How am I supposed to know this? I mean, I know I should be in trouble with God, but he seems to like that I, that I do this. But I just say, you're my, I have done this so many times. You're my teacher. How am I going to know this? I want it. I want to know this. I think the Father wants me to know it, <laughs> you know? So I'm just saying, would you... Would you help me to know this? And he does so much. And, you know, and even just little, have you ever heard of red flags when you hear somebody talking or when you're reading something? Well, this isn't a red flag, but it's a, it's a hmm. Well, don't just hmm. That's, that's going to get you nowhere. That'll get you a second of, hey, I wondered about that. Or maybe 10 years later, somebody else says, you know, I got to that, and I went, hmm, and you go, I did too. And you're going, we're so spiritual, both of us, because we hmmed. You know, we're not spiritual. We're just hmmers. Anyway, <laughs> we're the tri tribe of hmm. <clears throat> um, Instead of living in the years of Egyptian power, Hagar will have lived in the period where there were, where she was treated as an object toward the master's ends. But it is not just a slave thing. And certainly those were issues back then. But in this case, it's a woman thing. And that's still an issue today in many of those countries. It's a woman thing. Um, Sarah faced the same thing when, without her consent, she was to be joined to Pharaoh's harem. Remember we talked about when they were in Egypt. They're down here in Egypt, and Abraham says, okay, look, I got a, I got a great plan. Tell Pharaoh that you're my sister. We never heard a response from her. We never heard her go, no. <laughs> This doesn't seem right to me, you know. I, I'm married to you, you know. You don't because women didn't have those rights. And like I said, in some countries, it's still the same thing. But it's kind of interesting to know that in a sense, Sarah was just as much a slave girl as Hagar was because of no rights. I mean, that, I think that makes a difference in our story of things that are coming up. <clears throat> um, both women were weak and powerless, meaning not weak in them, their constitution, but in their situation, and powerless. But Sarah had the advantage because Hagar was her handmaiden, so that gave her... Can we say God bless you for a cough? Why do sneezes only get God blessed, you know? Anyway, sorry. I do ask a lot of questions, don't I? <laughs> okay, well, y'all think about that while I do this. Did you get the answer? <laughs> this isn't a game show. <clears throat> um, Here is an interesting thought. God spoke to Abra uh, spoke to Pharaoh. So this is, th I think this is really an interesting thought. God, when, when Abraham went down into Egypt, God spoke to Pharaoh, didn't he? Do you remember? And he spoke back to Abraham. 
God spoke to Pharaoh, the Egyptian, in a warning about not mating with Abram's wife. Right? Y'all remember that? But he didn't speak to Abram about not mating with an Egyptian woman. God didn't. Abraham's down there in Egypt, and Pharaoh comes up and says, Dude, this is wrong, you know? And I, you're getting me in trouble with God, and I don't want trouble with God, you know? So here, take her. So then Abraham's still standing there in that same place. They'd come back out unto the land. Sarah comes and says, um, Here, you know, take Take her, take Hagar, an Egyptian. Now the Egyptian, the Pharaoh was an Egyptian, and she's an Egyptian. And God doesn't say to Abram the same things that he said to Pharaoh. Well, why not? I mean, is this going to cause a lot of trouble later? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I mean, we don't know what... What, how many bullets Pharaoh dodged because he didn't take Sarah. But God allowed that. And apparently for his purposes, we would say, no, things got out of control. Will that be the case? Well, we shall see. Stay tuned and we'll find out. <clears throat> All right, another reason why it is important to note that Hagar is an Egyptian is related to what happened to Abram. Remember chapter 15, how God had given Abram a vision, a prophecy concerning his seed becoming slaves in Egypt? Yeah, see this? There's some, there is some intertwining going on here. There's some major things going on here. And so it's not spelling it all out at this stage. But God is in control. Um, knowing that vision. Okay, so, so Abram saw that thing. What kind of vision was it? It was, was kind of like a beautiful, dazzling vision, right? Tell me. It was a great darkness and a horror of darkness. Do you think he forgot? I mean, what's up with that? <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I, I think, no, I think if it was me now, I probably wouldn't because I'm just a dummy. But I think if, you know, Sarah came up with that, I would have said, wait a minute. Isn't there, like, didn't I see a vision from God of all of our seed being down in Egypt and suffering for 400 years? Maybe, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't go this way. You know, I'm just thinking. And she'd go, well, but we want to have the seed, you know. God wants us to have it, and this is the only way. And, you know. He didn't know it at the time, but he will learn through this. What if it took this to bring him to a place to really understand that wasn't the seed? What if it needed to show him sh that in him were still things that were willing to look around and find something else? In this case, Ishmael, the son of Hagar. You still got the, some of this stuff working, and you keep going, right? But we'll camp, man. We'll go. We'll camp right there, and we'll say, "Well, this is it. This is it. We're not. Don't have to go any further." No. Remember, I was talking last night about a journey. Anybody remember that? A journey means you have to keep going. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? You don't sit down in the dirt and go, I can't go any further. No, you can't. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. And that's why we have Christ in us, another life. And so 
if you looked at it like this, that the seed is in us, then that life wants to get to the Father. Yeah. He's like pressing forward, pressing forward, pressing forward. All right. Okay, we're taking names off the board. Did they get offended? I'm just kidding. I do it all the time. <clears throat> bless you. And if you cough, bless that too. Um, knowing that vision and realizing that Hagar was an Egyptian, how did this play out in Abraham and Sarah's individual view of having seed by her? Hmm. Our seed, 400 years, slavery. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, but again, it was all in God's hand. It was all necessary. All right, so um, oh, I think I skipped a sentence here. Uh, did Abram look at her as possibly somehow becoming the instrument? Talking about Hagar. Did Abram look at Hagar as possibly somehow becoming the instrument that would eventually help bring that horror of darkness about? Did Sarah even look down the road to the negative possibilities that could come from that union? Probably not. She might possibly have been consumed with her own personal lack of seed. And uh, Hagar was the way out. Okay. All right. So, question. Do we have stuff that is still wrong in us? <laughs> okay. Well, so did they. And they missed, they missed some big stuff. Amen? Was that... The ruin of everything. Should they have quit? Should they have, should they at that point fallen in a heap and cried? <laughs> you can. It doesn't matter, does it? It really does. You can fall in a heap and cry, or you can say, Lord, I'm going on because I want your seed. And that this is not a journey about my failures, but this is a journey about you getting your son. So, and you know what? I came to a place like that. You know, some of you may not realize, but I, I am, for a guy, I'm kind of emotional. I cry. Right? She makes me cry all the time. No. <clears throat> um, particularly in relationship to the Lord. But I used to, I remember when I was young and I would mess up and I would go down to the altars and I would, all, I would just like beat on the altar. Oh, I'm sorry, I did so wrong. <laughs> Will you ever forgive me? Oh, God, you know, and have I messed up the plan? And, you know, is this why you're not talking to me? <laughs> you know, all this stuff, he's going, no, that's not the reason. There is a reason, and it's real close to you. <clears throat> but, but I realized that all of that crying and carrying on and cry, do it. But all that carrying on, oh, all this stuff, you know, really didn't change anything with him. The point was, if, if it was a sin, I said, Lord, forgive me. And now I say, uh, let's get on with what's in your heart and... You know, I'm, I'm sorry for that, and I think you know my heart because I'm gone, I'm coming, I'm coming, I want you. But we think that if, we, if I'm like crying or if I'm just really carrying on, oh, I hate what I did, that that's really helping. And it doesn't change the covenant, right? The covenant is still in place. If, you, if you're doing good, it's there. And if you're doing bad, the covenant's still there. And you just keep following that covenant to his heart. I, you know? And, you know, I, I, you may think that when you stand before the Lord one day that he'll have a record and he'll go, you know, you cried 552 times. And that's got you extra points. 
<laughs> you know, or you, you know, you didn't just cry. You were special. You beat your head against the wall. Why? 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 You know, <laughs> and, and thinking that, that the, you know, the Lord's going, oh, this is so good. Hit harder. You know, <laughs> you know. but that's not how it works. If you need to cry, cry. But don't think that the, those tears are really changing God's heart. He's already for his son in you. You know? <clears throat> All right. And if you're someone who doesn't cry, you're just not an emotional person, don't go, well, you know, I saw Kelly cry once. And it was like, it was like holy ground. And I, so I went, I went like this, <laughs> cry, I'm, I'm going to force these tears out because I've got to show everybody I'm serious, but it ain't coming, so I'll never mind. <laughs> so you're okay. Either way, as long as you get up and you say, I'm with you, Father, and I want you, and, you know, that's the only thing that's important to you, so that's the only thing that's important to me. And are we good? <laughs> and he would go, yeah. You know? Because he always does. He always does. <clears throat> All right. So, um, well, last two sentences. So Sarah didn't think of, of the problem with uh, an Egyptian. She might possibly have been consumed with her own present lack of seed with Hagar as the way out. Many times we live in the here and now with no thought of future consequences. But the consequences here, <clears throat> as, as bad as it seems throughout all history, the, the consequences in our story in Genesis were that Abram still was looking for the seed in the wrong place. He didn't know what the seed really, who it was. And he made, he made the seed from that union with Hagar it. This must be God's answer. We need, see, we need to make mistakes. Do you understand that? Do you see how that would be a big mistake, but it was needed that he would never have seen, never really so deeply understood so that when the day came that God said, give me your son, your firstborn son, your beloved son, which was the seed, Isaac, uh, on an altar, he would say, I'm with you. Look, I am with you and your son, your seed. This is, I am, I'm just an intermediary here. I am just one who's, you know, I'm a vessel. But this, I am with you now. And the covenant... The covenant that everybody's raving about with Abraham really and truly is the one that he says right there after he offered up Isaac. Anyway. <clears throat> so, let's see. We still got a little time. Um, okay, let's go to Galatians. Galatians 4. And... Start at verse 21. Now you do know, don't you? And I'm sure you do. That um, all this story with Abraham and Isaac and Hagar and Ishmael and all of that, it's all um, an allegory of what God's doing with us. Galatians will tell us that. And it will tell us um, so many things that we may have missed or misconstrued and didn't see it in a spiritual realm. <clears throat> All right, so let's, uh, Galatians 4.21. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Okay, now what is that? This is talking about the law that came, what was it? 
400 years after. But he's talking about these two sons. He's not talking about, you know, like when the giving of the law, he's not talking about Moses and the opposite jettitude or somebody like that, you know. The, that's not what's going on here. This is going all the way back to the beginning. It's really an amazing thing if you really realize that, you know what? God has always had this thing in him in this way. <clears throat> For it is written that Abram had two sons, the one by a bondwoman or bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in, in Arabia. Okay, so he's saying that what took place with Moses on Mount Sinai was already, number one, prophesied, but not prophesied in words, but prophesied in a reality, in a picture, with um, Sarah and Hagar. Okay? And, uh, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Okay? So in that sense, it's even saying that it represents, nobody likes to hear this, but it's written right here, and it'll say it even more clear, um, that these are, uh, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar in Mount Sinai uh, is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is. Okay, if you follow what this is saying, it's saying, it's saying three things, three things that are one. Agar, Mount Sinai, Jerusalem, which now is. And it's saying they're all the same thing. Okay, well, you know, I could be killed for reading the scripture <laughs> you know, or pointing out what it's really saying. <coughs> um, uh, verse 25, for this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But, verse 26, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So now it's saying um, that, um, that Isaac, through Sarah, represents... Jerusalem, which now is, which is above, which we will find to be us, not Jerusalem, which now is located on the planet. But, but us, which is above. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is re written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Okay, where's that scripture quoted from? Isaiah. Okay, so we got Abraham way down here. And then we've got, um, we've got, time moving forward and we've got David and, and then we've got the captivity and then we've got the return from captivity and then we've got Jesus coming and then we've got Jesus dying on the cross and this is coming forth, this Jerusalem which is above is coming forth out of that and it's saying that we didn't do it. We were barren. And it said rejoice. Okay. So imagine if, if Abram understood all this. I was talking to Sarah. Now, honey, um, you know, we're with the Lord. And we're going to, 
We're going. We're going with him. All the way, baby. Back to back. And um, she goes, <laughs> but I'm barren. And he says, that's okay, rejoice. <laughs> and she's going, what the heck are you talking about? I, maybe you didn't understand me. I'm barren. Didn't you get that? <laughs> Look out there, honey. <laughs> Don't be back talking to me, remember? In the Bible, it's going to be written that you... You call me Lord. <laughs> I haven't read that part yet. <laughs> okay, look, I'm telling you. Okay, I understand you're the one going through it. I understand that. It's not that I don't care. It's just that this is the way God is leading us to bring forth only bring it forth, not to, not to produce it, not to make it happen, but to bear it, not, you know. And, and uh, if you understood that your lack right now, what time is it? I'm getting this low. Your lack right now is exactly what God needs to bring this forth, then you would really rejoice with me because I see it. I've seen it in his face. I've seen it in his heart. So I'm praying for you that you'll see it. <laughs> really? Yeah. Come here, knucklehead. Oh, okay. I'm going to be with you then. I'm going to be with you where you're at. Because I'm barren. <laughs> anyway. You see that, though? You see that? You see this reality of God in the face of the worst situations? In the face, see, see, Sarah would not be going through this, number one, if God hadn't said, You're gonna, you and him are going to bring forth the seed or it's going to come forth from him. It would, she wouldn't have been going through all that. Most of what she's going through really is the result of something in her heart wanting that seed and wanting what God wants and wanting what he wants. That's what's going on. I mean, you know, I mean, it would be, it would be bad if she's going, well, look, I just don't care. I'm barren and tough luck, buddy. I guess it ain't going to work out. But she cares, right? She cares. She cares. And she wants the Lord. She's crying out. And he's saying, I understand, but there's something greater at work here. There's something greater at work here. And, let's see. For it is so he would say, rejoice, thou Sarah, barren that bearest and not. Break forth and cry. And, but this is a good cry. Thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Now we, brethren. Ooh, did you get it? Now we. See, that's an allegory. That's a picture for us. So that when we feel barren or, or are barren, absolutely barren, and we're going, why doesn't this happen? And I want it to happen. And God, why don't you do this? And you got a problem with me? <laughs> and he'd go, yeah, but I did put my son in you, so you're okay. Come on. <laughs> Amen? <clears throat> now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. All right. So, <clears throat> is it possible 
that they, they made a mistake with Hagar and all that, but it really wasn't. It didn't matter one iota. All of this is saying we're of a different thing. Do, do you see that? Yes. And Abraham could have, you know, and Sarah could have said for years and years and years, this was a terrible mistake. But you, you keep on going. You realize ultimately what God has in his heart for his son, for his seed, will come forth. So, well, uh, could I have it now? You know, I mean, we do that, you know. If we were doctors, we'd have more patients. Anyway, so let me read this last bit here. You know, I actually, that came to me about two days ago, and I wrote it down. <laughs> and I wondered, and I really did, it's not in here. I wondered if I would ever get to use it, and there it was. <laughs> but it but as it, uh, as it, uh, okay, see, I have not edited this part. Um, but it is as if Sarah produced Hagar, but not by her own womb, but by other means. She thought of the idea she gave the handmaiden. But Galatians seems to have each one standing upon their own. So even if Sarah did that, think about that. Even if she did this thing here, when it's all said and done, God's contrasting Sarah with Hagar. He's not putting them together and saying, well, this is what you did and this is how you messed up. There's, look, there's so much promise in this stuff. There's so much hope. There's so much beauty of the heart of the Lord as we proceed forth. The journey really is in, in first to his heart and then into his heart because that's the land, vast and glorious and beautiful, and we can find more of him in, in relationship to that. But yet, there's a lot of bumps and stuff, you know? Like we said the other night, a lot of camel humps that you have to ride on, as we're saying tonight. There's a lot of mistakes that you make along the way, and you will make mistakes. And it's, I've made plenty of mistakes, and I have held on to the Lord. And I just say, that's, what we sh that's why we're here. It's the difference between just, you know, having a Bible class. This is with purpose and is meant to bring us all together, forming together. And like Israel, if they, if, if they were, somebody said there are three million when they came out. I don't know what number they were. But if there's three million people and there's somebody leading it up there, Let's say there's at least five people that are in the very, very front, and then there's people in the middle, and then there's people in the back. You're all still going. You're all on the journey. You're all heading in the right direction. You say, I don't see where we're heading. There's a m couple of million people in front of me. <laughs> you know? You're, go you're following the Lord. Yes. You know? You're following the Lord. And that was why, and I'll end with this, but that's why when they got ready to go into the land, the Lord said that, to the priest, get the Ark of the Covenant, which represents where the Lord dwelled. Get the Ark of the Covenant and get it high up there where everybody can see it and follow it. You're not following Joshua or any of those guys, Caleb or all those guys. You're following what you see. And what you see is him. And you're going, bring us in, Lord. Bring us in. Amen? Amen. Father, we cry out from a good cry. Uh, uh, but a true cry, a true cry that says, I want you, I, I seek you, I, I, uh, my heart is for you. And um, sometimes my heart isn't for you, Lord, and sometimes it's really off. And uh, I, I say, I'm sorry for that and I ask you to forgive me, but I'm not going to linger on that because you're drawing me and you keep me going. And in that, I trust so, Lord, thank you for your plan that works. And we give you all the glory in Jesus' name.